Welcome to the story worthy hour of power. My name is Christine Blackburn and I'm so excited. There are so many people here tonight. This is very exciting. People are entering the room. The count of the audience is going up and up. I'm so glad you're here, you guys. This is actually our fifth, no, our 16th show. It's our 16th Sunday night in a row and it just gets better and better. Once again tonight, I have four of fantastic storytellers, all from the Story Worthy podcast, so I know they're good, and they're going to be telling you guys true stories. And then in the after show at 7 o'clock, we begin Story Smash, the storytelling game show. And I got to tell you guys, it gets funnier and funnier every week. And tonight, we've got Danny Zucker in the house and Blanca Patch, and Peter Melman will as well be judging Story Smash at seven o'clock. So please stick around and watch Story Smash or you can play Story Smash. That's right. If you want to play Story Smash, then you are welcome to, there I am. Look, now I'm so big. If you want to play Story Smash, you guys just have to raise your hand and you'll be called on. And then you'll spin the wheel and tell a true one minute story on whatever it lands on. So it's a great night ahead. I can't wait to have some fun with you guys. There's a lot of shit going on in the world and we all need a break. So it's good to be here with you guys. And, uh, you know, look, it's been another, another crazy week in our country. The RNC convention was the other night and you know, you saw it. I saw it. No social distancing, not a mask to be seen. And, you know, as they panned around the audience, no one was wearing a mask except for the nurses, but the nerf nurses, uh, he didn't show those on screen because the nurses were wearing masks. My point is this, all the Trumps are lined up in a row and nobody has a mask on and there's creepy Rudy Giuliani. And all I'm saying is we cross our fingers and now we wait. Because who knows, maybe somebody was a super spreader that night. We could only cross our fingers and hope. So my daughter started her second week of eighth grade in her bedroom this week. And uh, I asked her the other day if she has any homework. And she said, Mama, it's all homework. Touche. Anyway, you guys, we have a great show lined up. And I'm so glad to get started right away. Now, this first guy coming to the stage, he's actually been on the show before. He was on my very first Story Worthy Hour of Power. He's such a talented guy, and I'm really glad to have him back. Now, he, um, he is a comedian, of course, and he's headlined venues, including the historic Howard Theater, the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, the Laugh Factory here in Hollywood, the San Francisco Punchline, Harvard University, and in addition, he has three highly acclaimed comedy specials. The first one was called Don't Make Me Take Off My Earrings. <laughs> the second one was called The Shade of It All. And the third one was called That Bitch Better Be Funny. <laughs> if, I've had a, if I'd had a nickel for every time I heard that, friend. All right, you guys, wherever you are, please put your hands together for my friend, Samson McCormick. Hey, everybody, and this is so good to be here. Uh, I hope y'all can see me pretty good. Oh, okay, I, I got it on. Y'all know I'm a lot older than I look. Y'all can't tell because black don't crack, but I'm old, okay? Y'all can't tell, but I'm 65, <laughs> okay? I am over here holding it together with coconut oil and Jesus, okay? So I am, I'm trying to get this right. Thank y'all for being here. Um... This is, it's been a very challenging time right now, uh, navigating the whole pandemic situation. Thankfully, I have had the opportunity to connect with some of my favorite family members. One of the great things about uh, life is you get to, you, as, and, and as you evolve and grow as a person, you get to pick and choose, very important, the family that you choose to associate with. And it also means that you get to be selective about uh, your friends, you know, and so I have gotten an opportunity to connect, reconnect with my favorite family member who is my Aunt Jackie, right? We all have an Aunt Jackie or no, an Aunt Jackie. My Aunt Jackie is that relative who, <laughs> she's never invited to anything, right? But she shows up anyway. 
<laughs> and when she shows up, she shows up loud, drunk, late. You know, she'll come in, tell everybody's business, start a big fight, make a big plate, and leave. That's my Aunt Jackie, okay? She's, uh, she just turned 74 in March. And in my, uh, in my third, I was joking earlier, but in my 35, in my 35 years of living, I think I've only seen this lady sober one time, okay? And that one time she was very upset. <laughs> she was very miserable. Uh, she was very cranky and she was on the way to the liquor store, okay? Um, I like her because I'm about to say some fucked up stuff. So just bear with me. It's okay. You know, this is, this is, it's okay. I remember my mom used to drop us off over at Aunt Jackie's house and I was about seven years old and Aunt Jackie, she would be looking at us coming and she'd be like, I'm oh, mad I got to sit in here and watch y'all. So, you know, we'd sit down and, you know, I might go up in there and grab her remote and change the channel or something like that. And every time you like did something she didn't like, she would blurt out a family secret. So say she would be in there watching The Young and Restless and I would pick up the remote control and change the channel. She would be like, that's why you don't know who your real daddy is. That man who lived with y'all ain't the one. Now you touch that remote again, I'm gonna tell you another secret. <laughs> you know, that was my Aunt Jackie. Um, I remember we used to like be running around her house and uh, I might accidentally, you know, kids, you know, I might accidentally like knock a lamp or something off, off her uh, table in the living room or something like that. And she would get mad. She'd be like, shut the fuck down in here. And then she would be stewing. And she would just sit there and she would smoke her new board. Mm. Pour her some Hennessy. She drank Hennessy and she would sit there and she would look at us. Y'all let a motherfucker get on my nerves. Your mama need to hurry up and come back over here and get y'all. Damn shame she don't know where your daddy is. I hope you don't look like it. Because it'll be a sad thing to grow up, look in the mirror, and see somebody you don't know. Like, that's abusive, but that was my Aunt Jackie. Uh, you know, we might be running around, we might knock something down, you know. And uh, she's like, I said sit down in here. Be like, well, we want to go play. Well, go outside and go play hide and go seek. And we were very sheltered. So we'd be like, hide and go seek? What's hide and go seek? Hide and go seek? That's that game your daddy played with your mama when she's trying to get child support. You know, it's just my Aunt Jackie, she, she's the reason why I grew up so fast, okay? Um, also, you know, I come from a very religious Southern family who... They weren't supportive of me being gay when they found out that I was gay. And my Aunt Jackie, she always knew. I don't know if any gay folks are on the feed, but, you know, you always have that relative who, who knows. Um, and thankfully, she was supportive. She was very homophobic in a very loving way. Like, she loved gay people, but she would say stuff like, you know, we all know you are fat. And it's okay to be a fat, as long as you're the best one you can possibly be. Make sure when people call you one, they got to put a number one on the front of that motherfucker. Like, that was my Aunt Jackie. Um, I remember when I was about seven years old, we were having a birthday party. It was my, I've only had two birthday parties in my, in my childhood, and they were singing Happy Birthday to me. And so when they got finished singing Happy Birthday, she went in her purse, and she got a tiara, and she put it on my head. And she said, there you go but we're all gonna call him a princess. He's not a queen, he's a princess because he's only six years old. You know, that was my Aunt Jackie. I'm from DC originally. Um, I don't know how many of y'all on the feed remember the Oscar Mile Wiener Song Contest. Y'all remember the Oscar, well, we gotta go back first. Let's go back a step. The Oscar Mile Wiener Song, okay? Um, and I went to Iverson Mall, which is, that was like our neighborhood mall, and they used to have the fair in the parking lot every August or September. And I beat seven other kids four years in a row in the Oscar Mayer Wiener Song Contest. And it started to annoy her a little bit. 
because she would have to come up there and sign for the hot dogs. I would get a, uh, whenever you won, you would get like a hat, you would get like a swag bag, and they would give you like two months supply of jumbo hot dogs. So when I won the hot dogs, she would just say smart shit. Like she would come up there and she would sign the waiver. So I'd get the hot dogs. She'd be like, yep. Yeah. It's written in the stars for you, you know. And then I would get back to the house. I really loved hot dogs. I really love hot dogs. So I'd be eating my hot dogs, jumbo hot dogs, and she would be sitting there looking at me like, all right, you're going to make some man happy someday, <laughs> you know. And finally, when I got in, you know, it's, I don't know how many of y'all have gay friends or whatever, but when I got in, um, when I got in high school, I was really struggling with trying to, you know, maintain a sense of masculinity and all those different things. And, um, you know, and I was still acting like I was going on dates with girls and I was playing, I was on our football team and I was dating our quarterback on our football team. And I was, I was, I was a wide receiver. So gay. Um, but, me and the quarterback, we were dating, so we were both like these really, you know, these manly boys, you know, and so I would sneak him over to my house and we would mess around and do whatever we were going to do and be done before anybody got home. So one night we were in there, you know, we're kissing and carrying on and we weren't expecting anybody to be home and the lock turned. And Aunt Jackie came in. She's like, oh my God, hold on, set up, set up. Act normal, act normal. Turn off Britney Spears. Turn on ESPN, and we're sitting there, and Aunt Jackie walks in. Y'all can't speak? Oh, um, hi, Aunt Jackie. Good evening, ladies. And she just left and walked out of the living room. She knew, and uh, I think it was it was that that kind of affirmed me and saved my life. And um, I'm very lucky to have an aunt as supportive and loving, and caring and awesome, and who's such a fun drunk <laughs> as my aunt Jackie. And that's my story. I just wanted to talk about my aunt Jackie. Thank you, Christine, for doing this. Thank you, everybody, for showing up, and everybody who's going to be. Uh, sharing later on tonight and if you have instagram come on over and follow me on instagram at samson mccormick y'all be safe wash those hands wear those masks and thank y'all for having me yay samson mccormick you're the best <laughs> wait how you long are have too. you been thank imitating you. how long have you been imitating aunt jackie since i was like five i've been <laughs> imitating her all my life because she's just that awesome okay she Where is does just she that live? awesome uh, uh, Missouri City, Texas. Wow. Yeah, Funny she lives stuff. in Missouri City, Texas. She's hilarious. She's the straight shooter in the family. Shoots straight from the hip and tell everybody's business. And she keeps she keeps justice in the family. I you love know, a it. Lot of, uh, you know, we have a lot of black sheep and things like that in the family. And <laughs> she always sides with the people who get bullied in families. And I think a lot of us would have better experiences in our families if we had an Aunt Jackie. That's that so really sweet. Stuck up yeah. for us. Yes. Wow, that's really sweet. I agree, Samson. Way to go, man. Well, thank you so thank much. You. I'm so glad you came back on the show. Yes, thank you for having me. Thank you for doing it. Thanks, Samson. Yeah. All right, All right you guys. Uh, we've got another talented person coming up right now. The best thing I like about this girl is just she is a hard worker. I love hardworking people in Hollywood because it is a uh, it's kind of a jungle out here, and you got to push your way through it, and this girl definitely does. She is a professional silly person. She's a podcaster. She's a yoga teacher. She loves Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> She's also a business owner, a boogie boarder, a salty snacker, a keynote speaker. I met her at uh, Podcast Movement, some of those big podcasting conventions. She speaks at those all the time as, as a keynote speaker. She's also an easy crier. Sometimes she's anxious. She's an oversharer. She's also an actress, uh, a shower singer, a pudding maker, a dorky dancer. 
She's a voiceover actor and a director. She's a writer and the host of the podcast, Project Woo Woo, which I've been on, and it is fabulous. You guys, please put your hands together wherever you are for my Lisa Orkin. Lisa. Hi. This is my first Zoom show. So, um, yeah, I'm breaking my Zoom cherry. You look great. Thank, thank you. Um, all right. So, welcome to my living room. I will begin. Um, okay, so I had this, this boyfriend once, and he was like the best boyfriend I ever had. And for two years, he made me bouquets from his yard, and he went out of his way to bring me gingerbread cookies, and he made me tea, and he made me toast every morning. He was kind, and he was gentle, yet there was no doubt he could kill a bear if needed. And I thought men like this were just, I don't know, urban legend, let, urgent, urban legend. but actually I thought, oh my God, I, I think I caught the big fish. This is the guy. I mean, it was a long distance relationship, I know. 300 miles up in Monterey, but I didn't mind. And um, so funny, I like keep thinking the Zoom's going out. All right, but I didn't mind, um, but that's ultimately what ended it. Um, and he just thought I was giving up too much for him and, and I, I shouldn't go back and that, you know, and I think ultimately he just didn't want me writing stories about him. I think that was the issue. And so we broke up and I was devastated. It had been nine months since we actually had unintentional breakup sex over pancakes. And afterwards I thought, oh, do you want to get back together? And he was like, no. And I just, I just cried. I tried so hard to get back with him. And then I had like two semi relationships since him, since like that, that pancake morning where we had sex accidentally. And the first guy I called the jackhammer because literally I could have slipped out from under him, made bacon and eggs, eaten them, watched Rachel Maddow slip back in, and he would not have noticed. He still would have been making, you know, holes in the blacktop. No, would not notice. The second guy gave me a 20-minute apology after we had sex every, every time. And I don't, I don't really know what to call him except the apology guy. And then um, out of the blue, my ex he texted me and said, thinking of you. And I thought, oh, he's thinking of me. And I called him and I said, this is an opening. Maybe, maybe if we had sex, I, I could make him laugh and I could hook him back in. I know, naive, really, really. I'm like too old to hook a man with sex, right? So I said, I'll come visit. And he hesitated and I said, and let's just have a sex weekend. That's it, just sex, no expectations, no tears, no, no drama, nothing. And I thought, look at me, the cool girlfriend. And he believed me. And I believed me even more, sort of. And I arrived at his house and he gave me this super long hug and he grabbed my face and he kissed me like we had never broken up. And it felt so good and so familiar. And I thought, I know him. I know this man and, and he knows me. And he said, close your eyes, I have a surprise. I'm like, really? Yeah, just close your eyes, put your hands out. I thought, oh my God, he's going to propose. Is this really happening? And then I thought, oh my God, what was I going to say? Was I going to say yes? I don't think I want to get married again. And I, I couldn't live here. Could I live here? And I, I could. I could live there and I could teach improv at the local college. I could do this. We, we could be married. I mean, we could have separate houses, like, like, like Virginia Woolf would say, you know? So he said, Lisa, I want to blindfold you. And, and I was like, oh, okay, okay, I guess he just wants to make this a really big surprise. He's like, no cheating. And he kisses my head and he blindfolds me. And I nodded and I'm trying to contain my glee and I extended my hand and he put this, the blindfold on me. And then um, it took him about 30 seconds to put something on my wrist that felt furry, like very furry. And then he lifted the blindfold up and they were furry pink handcuffs on my wrist. And I looked at him like, a, like, a, like I, I just, I felt like one of those dogs that made like a weird little, like made a noise and so like you just sort of do that weird, like what did I hear? And, and then he said something about how he always wanted to control me and keep me still. And I thought, all right, he's showing me one of his truths and, and I can love even his weird side. I could do that. And he mumbled something about his dream sex weekend with me and, and code words, red light, green light. And I, I loved him. And I thought, this is what he wanted. I, I can handle this. And I, I thought, I, I can give him his, his fantasy. I know I can. And, and 20 minutes in, I thought, 
I have no idea who this man is. The man I knew is definitely not this man, the little man who gave me bouquets and, and all that stuff. This, this, is, this is not him. And I was sure if I like lifted my blindfold, I'd be having sex with like Chewbacca or something. It was so weird. And then like two hours later, two hours, who goes two hours at our age? He offers me Gatorade. And then I, it was crazy. And then I thought, what? He like kept biting my nipples. Why was he biting my nipples? That was so weird. He had never done that before. And, and then I looked at him standing there in the, in the mood light with this like ridiculous, never ending boner. And he's like, ready for another round? And for some reason, the words yes, yes, came out of my mouth. And he reminded me of the code words and he put an Altoid in his mouth and he went down on me. And then somehow my overstimulated vagina, curiously strong vagina, spoke to me and said, red light, red light. So I screamed, red light, he stopped. And he lifted his blindfold. And he smiled at me like a 12 year old who had just taken his dad's car out for a joy ride. And, and I thought, did he always want to do this? How did I miss this? I gave him the questionnaire when we met, do you like your mom? Are, your, are you friends with your ex-wife? How old are your kids? Do you have any knife wounds? Do you feel the, the need to apologize profusely after sex? Do you take your anger out on waitresses at Denny's or Office Max? Like, like, I don't know. Will you send me 57 texts? Will you break up? Will you show up at work? Like I, I asked him all the questions and, I, and it just, and now I, I just couldn't add it all up. Do, do you, I, I didn't know who he, who he was. And I thought, I can't, I can't, I can't be with this man. And of all the pieces I have ever written, this was the hardest piece because I knew, I knew I was going to have to come clean with my friends about this, that I was going to tell him the real deal you know, that, that I would have to admit that I not only agreed to handcuffs and two hours of just vagina numbing sex, I'd have to admit to something worse, that the man I loved for two years, the man I loved for two years was a born again Christian. And worse, I went to his giant Christian mega church with the rock and roll band every Sunday, and I liked it. He was not a Republican, he was just a born again Christian. Still, I'd have to admit that to my friends, you know? And, and I, I didn't, I, I wasn't gonna believe in Jesus. Like I, I couldn't go that far, not because I believe Jesus died for our sins, but, but it was just so far away from my life, I just couldn't. And I, 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 I wanted to sing about Jesus because that was kind of fun, just singing in a big crowd. And the next morning, I woke up with him and we went to the mega church and there we were holding hands, singing about Jesus and like jump cuts of him and the furry handcuffs kept going through my mind. And I thought, I don't, I don't really know who he is. I don't. And, and how did I get here? I'm a normal woman. I'm a mom. I'm a daughter. I don't pick up men in CD bars. I don't, I don't do drugs. I, I, I yoga and I hike and I listen to Eckhart Tolle and I drink green drinks and I raised a child on my own who's grounded and went to college and works and, and I watched a parent die and I fought cancer. I've produced, I've done so many things. I've climbed giant mountains. I took my daughter to Paris. I have lived. I have accomplished. Why is it so hard to find a normal man? I am asking for very little. Okay, maybe that's the problem I'm asking for very little. And my friends would say, oh, you haven't learned your lesson yet. I don't know what the lesson is I'm supposed to learn. There's no lesson. There's no lesson. In my 13 years of being divorced, I, I still don't know what it is. And I think actually my whole family's like, just settle down already. You're making us nervous. It's for them. It's not for me. I'm just, I'm just, I'm making them very, very nervous, very uncomfortable. So I know this man is not going to make me whole. I know he's not the answer. And I, I know the answer somewhere deep inside of me. So deep, I'm probably not ever going to find it. You know, when you feel whole, you'll find a man that that's never going to happen. Nobody ever really feels whole. And I've looked in every crevice of my brain and in my heart, and I, 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 I can't find the missing piece. And after this like super restless sleep next to him, I like, I put my arms around his skinny, like chest. He was very skinny and I could feel his heart beating and like pulsating. And I, I felt like I could reach in with the palm of my hand and I could just pull his heart out. And then I thought, 
I, I'm just going to pull it out and I'm going to run down four blocks to the Pacific Ocean. And then like a, like a warrior, I'm just going to run with this bleeding heart in my hand and thousands of women are going to follow after me and they're all going to run with me and they're going to have the hearts of all the, the men that they trusted too. And then, and then suddenly we're just going to like throw the hearts, this like beating hearts into the Pacific and, and the sea was going to like be like the color of Chianti and, and the hearts would sink down to the bottom of the sea. And as they sunk down, like little pieces of Pez would come up through the water and we would all open our mouth and the Pez would come in our mouth, sink down and fill that little hole in our hearts. And then we, we would be whole. I, I think that's the deal. But that's my story. Hi, wow, Lisa. Lisa, was this when you ended up going to that convent? No. Well, yes. I went to the convent right before that. Yeah. I tend to do really wild things when I go through grief in my life. Yeah. I went to a convent. Yeah. That's right. I forgot about that story. Yeah. Yes. And you're Jewish. Yes. And you're, you're I'm Jewish. Jewish. Okay. My mother believed that she was a nun at some point, like in another life. And so, and we grew up like in a Christian neighborhood. So I think I always had this sort of love relationship with like, well, that's Catholic nice. Catholic. I like that. Yeah. I like that. And you are a single mom like I am. You've raised your daughter as well. And how's she doing now? She's not grounded now, right? No. She's, She's not grounded. She works right there because we work out of the house now. And she just moved back to LA. And so this is us during the week. Me here, her there. Aw. I think that's sweet. I think that's adorable. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. That was a great story. And you're a wonderful thank storyteller. Aw, and thank you. You've helped me so many times technolo technologically. So thank you for the tech help over the years as well. I appreciate it. You're very it. welcome. All right, I'm putting my thing back on. All right, right on. Okay. <laughs> By the way, yeah, you can see Lisa Orkin now. She's putting on a, like a, a piece of tape or something over her lens. But I now have official camera cover swag. So if you want a story worthy camera cover, you give me your address and I promise I will send you in the mail, the United States Post Office, I will send you in the mail a, um, a, a little camera cover. Yes, I will. I also have stickers and bookmarks and it's a lot of fun. So put your, put your address there in the chat box and I'll be happy to send you some swag. Uh, also, you guys, tonight, now last week I told kind of an intense story, so tonight I want to lighten it up, and tonight I thought I would use one of these Zoom options where I would share my screen, and what I thought I'd show you guys is a compilation of some of the commercials that I've done. I don't know if you guys know this, but I have done over 100 commercials. Some of the spots were really big, and some of them were really small, and some of them didn't air at all, because that's, that's the world of the commercial actress or actor. Lisa, actually, Lisa Orkin, she was just on, she does a lot of voiceover acting. But anyway, I've done a lot of straight on camera work. And, you know, for years, my category or my breakdown, this is kind of like who you are and what they're asking for. So for me, my breakdown was casual mom pretty, but average. And I would get ready for an audition and I'd say to my husband, how do I look, honey? And he'd say, pretty, but average. And I'd say, whew, I don't want to look better than that because I got to book a job. And the other thing you might not know about commercials is that it's very hard to book a job. It's quite difficult because there are people that come out to LA that have been on Broadway and they still can't get an agent. So the first problem is like getting an agent. That's, that's a difficult thing. And when I first got to LA, I was doing stand up at the improv and it was like a showcase thing. And after this woman came up to me and she asked me if I had an agent, if I had a commercial agent. And I said, yeah, actually I do. It's, but it's that big commercials unlimited and they're huge. And she, and she said, well, you know what? I'm going to be a better one anyway. And she gave me her business card and her name is Denise Stefano. And sure enough, she worked really hard for me and got me a lot of jobs. So uh, here's what you need to know. When you go out for an audition, you, you, know, you have to do your hair and makeup, of course. You have to have on certain clothes, of course. You have to have a certain wardrobe to begin with. You know, I always had, I always had, 
<laughs> denim shirts or like blue, like that really bright blue color that, you know, everybody looks good in. And I'd have, you know, khaki pants or jeans, mom jeans. And anyway, you'd, then you'd leave the house. I'd leave my house here in Los Feliz, travel all the way to maybe Santa Monica, 45 minutes away. Then, then you're waiting for the audition and you could wait, I don't know, 30 minutes, hour, hour and a half. And then they go in, you go into the audition room and you audition and the audition can be simply something like this. Hi, I'm Christine Blackburn. Thank you. So it can be as simple as they want to see you. They want to see your profiles. That's all they want. And now you drive back home 45 more minutes across town. And that was one audition. And then if you did well, you're going to get a call back and you repeat the whole thing over again. You go back to the audition place in Santa Monica or wherever it is, and you wear the same clothes so they remember you, and then you get the call back. Then you do the call back. At that time, there's usually producers in the room or other people. And that call back, you might also wait another hour, hour and a half. Then you drive home. So as you can see, the work in being a commercial actress is clearly in the auditioning. So if you audition, let's say you got 30 auditions a year, and that's a lot of auditions or 40 auditions, you might book two <laughs> or one or zero. So when you finally book the commercial, it's super exciting. And you go to work that morning, the call time is 7am or 6am. And you are the only person who's happy on the set. There's really the only one that wants to be there. Everybody else is ready to go. Everybody else is just like, wrap it up. Anyway, I have been fortunate enough to do like I said, like I said, over a hundred commercials and I, I do feel really lucky. Uh, now, of course, my category has changed. Now it's casual grandma, pretty, but average, thank God. Uh, but yeah, now I get called out for really only pharmaceutical products and that's it. Pharmaceutical products because, you know, old people have to take medication, I guess. And so the people who actually, like I have a child, as you guys know, most of you know, the people who are the real moms like I am now, I don't play a mom on TV. I play a grandma. And if you don't have children, like I didn't have children when I was 31, 32, 33, you'll work like a bandit as a mom. So it's really funny the way it works out. But anyway, I wanted to share with you guys a quick reel that I put together and it moves very quickly. It's three minute longs. It's three minutes long. It takes, it goes really quick. And what you guys should do is have a little paper and pencil beside you and ask me any questions you want about these commercials. And I will answer you uh, after the, after I'm done sharing my screen, after I'm done sharing my screen. Yeah. Okay. So first I have to um, change my microphone and then I'll share. And thank you for being patient. And I'll be right back after you see this ridiculous, ridiculous reel. Thank you for tuning in. I am so happy you could join us because in the next few minutes, you will learn about a powerful new breakthrough piece of technology that can dramatically change your life and the lives of your loved ones forever. It's the original triple candy machine, the hideaway platter, the raging monkey, the amazing foot rocker. It's the amazing three-in-one rolling mincer with tenderizer and garlic press. That's real cat urine. And we've gathered a group of cat owners to see what they smell. I don't smell this at all. Wow. I don't smell any urine at all. The secret, world's best cat litter, is made from whole kernel corn. Mmm, cherry. Oh my God. And how many times have you looked at your Bible and thought, I should really read this more? Then you need the Speaking Bible from IdeaWorks, the most convenient Bible ever. Simply slide out the hidden USB interface and plug it into your computer. Matthew chapter 6. Take it that you do not your arms. <laughs> What would it be worth if you could simply and powerfully change? If you can increase 
the size of your breasts. Make them firmer or rounder, safely and naturally, would you? You know how each month during your cycle, your breasts get a little larger? This is the newest, quickest, easiest, and safest way to increase the size and shape of your breasts. Ow, 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 ow! Oh, jeez! Oh, oh, oh. Ah, ah. Oh. Okay, now that's what we mean by the ouch factor. Habla espanol? No problemo. It also comes in a Spanish language version. Vosotros, pues, oraréis así. Replace your toilet flapper. Begin by turning off the water supply at the wall. Flush the toilet to empty the tank. Next, disconnect the ears of the flapper from the fill tube. And then disconnect the chain from the flush handle. All right, all right, I'm back. What did you think of that? That is crazy. Yes, this is actually the Dr. Copeland's natural breast enhancer. That's it. This was 125. And what you do here, now you of course it comes with two. Yes, we know this. You take this here, you put that right on your breast, then you just simply suck your way to buxomness. <laughs> and then you suck this onto your breast and you walk around the house for 10 minutes a day. And then your breast can be any size or shape you want them to be. It's fantastic. You also saw that I did an entire commercial series for the Nevada Water Company. That's right. I showed everybody on earth how to fix a leak. That's right. How do you change a flapper in your toilet? Well, let me show you in this clear commode. Thank you. That was me. Uh, oh, yeah, you saw me eating some cat litter. Well, sure. Who hasn't eaten a little cat litter in a commercial? <laughs> All right. Any questions? Anybody have a question about my, <laughs> my crazy commercial career? Uh, the, the toilet demo was helpful. I agree, Kamala. I agree. The uh, toilet demo was really good. They actually still use that. If you live in the state of Nevada and you're spending too much on your water bill, they're going to send you a, a, a tape. It was a VHS tape. It's called How to Detect a Leak with Christine Blackburn. Yeah, that's right. I've fixed toilets. Thank you very much. And yes, in fact, I was eating cat li litter. It was so disgusting. The cat litter, it was the cat litter. It's a cat litter straight out of the bag. And it doesn't taste like whole corn. They say it's corn, but of course it tasted like clay litter. It was disgusting. And I had to deal with the cat and I had to deal with the teleprompter. And then there was the guy who was like the, the cat wrangler. And then there was the people from the world's best cat litter. And they wanted to make sure I ate enough. I smelled the urine and it was disgusting. It was disgusting. Oh, there's something talking about another uh, in New York City for the same idea, but to enlarge the penis. That is so funny. And then, of course, you yeah, have the speaking Bible. You can't go wrong if you have a USB port speaking Bible en espanol. Anyway, you guys, uh, I've done a lot of commercials. That's what it is in LA. I've been out here for 23 years. On. And then after the two storytellers, we're going to start Story Smash, the storytelling game show, which again is just hilarious. Danny Zucker's in the house, Blank Patch is in the house, and Peter Melman will be joining them as well. So right now, let's hear from another true story from a really talented girl. Uh, this girl, she's a journalist and a filmmaker, and she's fascinated with life's dark side. And I mean the really, really dark now, her stories have appeared in, New York, in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Essence, as well as on PBS and MTV. And she has covered everything from serial killers to the Wisconsin Dairy Princess who murdered the homecoming queen over the love of a local farm boy. Yeah, that's right. This girl has covered a lot. She wrote a book called Eight Ball Chicks, which chronicles a year that she spent with female gang members. So interesting. 
All right, you guys, wherever you are, please put your hands together for my very good friend, Ginny Sykes. Ginny. So, uh, you know how when you're growing up, there's always a family on the block that everybody else thinks is weird? You know, they give you the heebie-jeebies, you avoid their yard. Um, they're like the Adams family or Boo Radley. In my neighborhood, that family was mine. Uh, yeah, I grew up in Wisconsin, and you may know it as a dairy state. If you're from there, it's the serial killer state. Uh, we have a lot, Ed Gein, Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey worked in a chocolate factory, but he liked to eat people. He ate people and kept their skulls in his refrigerator. Now my family, we didn't eat people, but we did keep a skull on top of our refrigerator. It was my dad's. Um, it belonged to my dad, it, it wasn't his. So a little backstory. My parents indulged, uh, they believed in indulging their children's every creative whim. And when I was six, what I really liked to do was scrape dead animals off the road and take them back home to my basement and try to bring them back to life because I was obsessed with Frankenstein and Herman Munster. It was kind of like the bad boy versus the good boy. My mother saved a letter that I wrote, Herman. I guess I was trying to sound sophisticated. Uh, I wrote, Dear Herman, I am six, going on 10, you big handsome man, you. Which is impressive. I had that confidence because I have none now. But back to the basement of dead animals. So one day I'm trying to reanimate a squashed bird and my dad walks in and he's like, Jenny, what are you? And he looks around and he says, well, Jenny, I think you're showing an aptitude for science. Now your father might've given you an ant farm or a chemistry kit. My father gave me and my, my brother who is two years older, a human skull. And this wasn't a skull that was bleached white like a museum specimen or a medical lab or from a medical lab. It was brown and rotting and it uh, looked like it had been buried for many years, which apparently it had. My brother told me that when our grandpa was a little boy in the Ozarks, he had uncovered these bones, uh, which belonged to a Native American Indian. And he took them home and kept them in his barn. But then he got scared and started to bury them back one by one till all was left was the skull. Uh, years later, I asked my, my father about that. And he goes, no, your grandfather was an optometrist. He felt optometrists didn't get the same respect as medical doctors and so he thought if he displayed a medical skeleton in his office he'd look more professional uh, apparently he acquired some bones that he was going to wire together he never did it and the skull just stayed in the back office on a cabinet collecting dust uh, when grandpa died way before i was born uh, my father was going through with his things and he comes to to the skull and he's like, how do you get rid of a human head? I can't throw it in the garbage. And if I bury it in the yard, an animal might dig it up. So his solution was to put it in a hat box and take it on the train back to his college in Oregon. So he's got this hat box on the seat next to him and he spends the whole trip terrified that somebody will ha ask him what's in it or that it will tip over and roll down the aisle. Somehow he manages to get to Portland, Oregon, meet my mother, they move to Wisconsin and now the skulls in our basement because we were that family. So my brother Rex and I love the skull 
but we weren't very fond of each other. Uh, I think Lisa was talking about, you know, having a little present after uh, her boyfriend asked her to close her eyes. Uh, my brother would do things like, close your eyes, I have something for you. And I'd close my eyes and he'd put a scab, he picked off his knee into my palm. And another time he, he bit me on the neck and I was gonna go tell on him. And he said, hey, now you can become a vampire and fly all over. But first you have to go uh, and bite other kids. So I was like, okay. I grabbed a towel, put it on as a cape, and I ran into the neighbor's yard and started biting all the, all the other kids until one of the big brothers, Moose Lewitsky, chased me, chased me out with a bat. But the one thing my brother and I could bond over was the skull. It empowered us against bullies. Like, okay, like when Moose came after me with that bat, we just put the skull on top of a broom handle and screamed, Moose, it's your head on a stick. So uh, one day uh, our babysitter came over, Mrs. Dehoviak. She was uh, in her 70s and extremely large. Uh, she would never do anything but sit in a chair with her baggy socks and her big black boots and kind of just order us around. So she told me to take a nap. So I tried it down to my bedroom and I grabbed my sock monkey, not unlike this one, and put in my arms and, and took a nap. A little while later, you know, I started to wake up and the monkey felt hard and cold. And I looked down and there was the brown grinning skull looking at me. And my brother obviously had pried out the monkey and put the skull in instead. And I wasn't scared. What I thought was, my brother is a dick. I was six years old, but I knew what a dick was. And I thought, and it, cause, because it was a betrayal, you know, this was skull was supposed to be used to scare others. So I decided to finally act like a normal six year old girl. And I screamed my head off. And I hear boom, boom, boom. Mrs. Tehoviak had gotten up for the first time. Boom, boom. It sounded like Herman Munster was coming. She flings open the door and she sees this tiny girl screaming at a rotting skull in the center of her bed. I don't remember her reaction. What I do remember is what happened later that night. My father called a family meeting my mother, father, brother, and I sat at the kitchen table with a skull in the center. And my dad shakes his head and says, sadly, you kids don't know how to respect the head. And I start shouting, Rex put it in my bed. And my brother yells, she wasn't scared, she's faking. My dad goes, does it matter? He walks over to the fridge, puts the skull on top of it where we can't reach it. He says, tomorrow it's gonna to be gone. The next, uh, he was gonna donate it to the university science lab. The next day, he did. Every Christmas, my brother and I fight about whose fault it is that the skull is no longer with our family. But years later, when I was an adult and visiting my parents, we attended an event at the university and my father spied the university president and he went over and he introduced himself. Uh, hello, I'm Dr. Sykes. Uh, many years ago, I donated a skull to your science department. I was wondering if I could have that back. And the president looks at him and he says, uh, well, we don't label the skulls by the donor's name so, um, and we have a lot of them. I don't know which one is yours. So I'm gonna say no. And as my dad, you know, sadly walked away, I'm sure that president thought, what a weirdo. We were still that family. Thank you. Okay, that's crazy, Denny. <laughs> no wonder why you, you did the macabre and the, the crazy stuff, yeah? 
Oh yeah, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Now, are, are you going to give away your body to science? Will you give away your skull, your organ? Uh, you know, I actually took an, a, a dissection class, yeah. uh, an anatomy and, and dissected bodies. And after doing it, I, because um, I just wanted to do something unusual. <laughs> and after I did it, I thought, no, I wouldn't. I think it's great that other people do, but uh, that was, yeah. That is simple. Uh, that is definitely super crazy. Now, wait, how did you take that class? Like just a, a community college course? What? <laughs> Uh, I had this thing called a Knight Fellowship, with, which they give journalists, and you go to Stanford for a year and you can take any course on campus. And so I was like, what can I take that I absolutely could not take otherwise? Yeah. And so I took um, dissection. That's a fabulous idea. Really cool. Really interesting. I don't know what that is. I think we're getting some um, spam in the chat room. I'll see if I can get rid of all that. Uh, and in the meantime, we do have, who is this person? Somebody is, um, you know what they call this? They call it bombing. What do they call oh. it? They call it bombing. Well, this it's is Zoom very bombing. exciting. This is very exciting. Now, hang on. <laughs> I got to figure out how to get them out of here. Uh, I'm going to figure that out. But before I figure that out, we got one more storyteller. And this guy is tremendous. I'll fix the chat room. I'll get rid of the crazy guy. Uh, but you guys are in for a real treat. This next guest, he is just a tremendous talent. He's a writer and a comedian and a producer, and he's best known for serving as a writer and producer on the TV series Seinfeld, nearly, uh, really through all of the nine-year run. He's responsible for many episodes, including the shrinkage episode, the sponge-worthy episode, the yada yada episode, and so many more, yada yada yada. His latest book, I Hold My Left Hand, I read it, and it is so good. It's dense, but it's smart, and it's really funny. It's called Hashtag Me As Well. You guys, please welcome the very talented Peter Melman. Yes. I'm telling um, a story that Christine actually knows. Uh, this goes way back to my childhood, um, back in the 1400s. No. Um, this starts off in 1967. I was nine years old. I noticed that a lot of kids in my neighborhood were wearing football jerseys with the number 69 on it. Everybody was wearing these jerseys with 69 on it. It didn't have any team name or anything. It just had the number 69. You know, I was a, I was a little kid and I was like, you know, groping, you know, like, 69 like why 69 or why 69 or why 69 you know my father had had season tickets to the new york giants football games but number 69 on the giants was a guy named willie young and he was a terrible player i'll never forget once you know like there was this incredibly accomplished alcoholic behind us who yelled out during the game, hey, Young, you're a fat shit. You know, I was so embarrassed hearing that kind of language in front of my father. But, you know, all I could think of is that, you know, 69, it felt like it had to be, it had to mean something that had nothing to do with football. It just had to. That was confirmed a few days later. I was at a delicatessen with my father and the guy behind the counter yells, is calling out the numbers and he yells out, 69, who's next, 69. And all the kids in the delicatessen, the older kids, started cracking up. And I was thinking like, you know, this is really, I don't know what this is about, you know, and like, even now I am totally incapable of, you know, stopping my thoughts from going to really undesirable places. And back then I just started thinking that 69 must mean something really, really dark. And, you know, and at that point, you know, 10 years old, all dark things tended to go towards, you know, all, all dark mysteries ended up somewhere in sex. 
Well, you know, the, um, it was interesting, uh, 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 you know, so I was kind of like on this search to find out what 69 meant. Um, and then, um, you know, and like everything about sex, everything was fascinating back then, you know, like I remember being in this kind of place called Bell Book and Candle, which was like a psychedelic shop. And they were, you know, with all the strobe lights and, the, you know, and I, they had the radio station in New York, WNEW playing. It was like the famous progressive rock station. And I heard the DJ, he was about to play Light My Fire. And he goes, Light My Fire, man. That is the greatest sex music you have. You have the long version for regular sex and the short version for a quickie. Hmm, quickie. See, like I was fascinated by that. What did quickie mean? So I, I looked it up in an unabridged dictionary and they said that quickie was a book or a movie produced in a real hurry. Let me tell you something. You know who never got a lot of pussy? Noah Webster. <laughs> Another fascination came a little while later when my classmate, Eddie Clark, peered down to his right from when we were in Glee Club and he said, boy, Gail Morrissey has a great ass. I'm like, what? I was like totally confused. Like, I didn't even know the ass was something I was supposed to be looking at. You know, I was, you know, I was like, all right, I guess, uh, you know, I, I mean, I'll look at asses. I can, you know, I'll talk about asses. I'll compliment asses. I could do that. I mean, they, you know, and that wasn't really hard because there they were lined up in alphabetical order in every class, you know. But 69 was really different. It couldn't be so easily dismissed, you know. The number was a fad, and it had to mean something specific, something crucial to life here in this, you know, what was the cheeriest country on earth. You know, so, um, God, there's another mem moment I remember, you know, like my parents, you know, they tried to give us a real liberal upbringing. We went to this like really super hot restaurant in New York called Max's Kansas City, where there was a big hippie scene, you know, and you could smell pot there and everything. And I'll never forget my, this girl, this woman, braless walking by and giving my, giving me and my brother the, the peace sign. It was like, and then my father flashed the peace sign back at her. I thought he was pretty cool. But, you know, at the same time, it wasn't like I could go up to my father and say, hey, Dad, you know, what does 69 mean? So I decided that, like, I would search my school and try to find people who might know. Now, there was one guy named Kenny Kantrowitz. He was um, doing his second tour of fifth grade. And, um, you know, he was incredibly stupid, but he had, you know, like a grasp on taboo subjects, you know. So my plan was to sidle up to Kenny and mention that on a math test, I'd gotten a grade of 69, you know, thinking maybe he'd, you know, like laugh and then explain everything to me. Well... I told Kenny that about my exam, that I got a 69, and he congratulated me. And that was it. Ay, ay, ay. My second source was a guy named Gary Lauer. He was, he was my brother's age, three years older than me, and he had this gigantic nose. His nickname was Face the Nation. He, um, he was named, he, he was actually named by somebody who uh, was really good in our neighborhood, famous for making up great nicknames. He, ha he also had a, uh, a cat that he named after a baseball player, Willie McCovey, but that's off the subject. Um, anyway, you know, like 
I went up to Gary Lauer while he was watching a bunch of guys playing basketball. And he, he says to me, hey, little Mel, what's going on? And, you know, I was talking and, we, I, you know, I made a couple of jokes and Gary was laughing and, you know, and we, we were having a good time. So I just, you know, I just threw it out there. I said, hey, what's the big deal with all these guys wearing 69 on their shirts? Well, that's when Gary no longer stopped laughing. His nervous system, like, jumped through the roof. He just goes, what did you ask me? You know, and I tried to backpedal. I said, you know, the shirts with the number 16, and I'll, I'll forget it. Well, it was too late. Face the Nation bold, bolted right up and went into the basketball game in the middle of the fast break, pulled one guy aside and says, Melvin's little brother just asked me what 69 meant. Everybody was cracking up, and I just ran. I was so embarrassed, I just ran. I blew out the side of the schoolyard. I ran home full tilt. You know, like, my head was like so baggy with questions that were like way above my head. You know, I didn't know what to do. I just kept running. And then I got to this space between two buildings, which happened to be the space, the exact place when I was, five years old, where a guy named Stephen Squirsky told me that President Kennedy had been shot. And there, when I got there, when I turned the corner of that little area, I bumped into a guy named Teddy. His name is Teddy Scharf. And he was about six young months younger than me but he was wearing a shirt that said 69 on it. Well, I was like, where did you get that shirt? And Teddy got nervous, real nervous. He says, I grabbed it out of my brother's drawer. I thought, you know, everyone's wearing 69 shirts. I don't even know why. I just looked up on 69 on the Giants. It's really young and he stinks. I don't get it. Does 69 mean anything? Do you know what it means? So Teddy was on the case also. I thought we could partner up, you know, make this kind of a two-man research project. So anyway, a couple of weekends later, I went to uh, Eddie Clark's house, the guy who he, where, you know, he's the guy who, and then even then he would continue talking about Gail Morrissey's ass. I um, sat there, we played around, I don't know. And then I just left and I had like a dollar in my pocket. So I decided to stop by this pizzeria called Lorenzo's. It was on Union Turnpike in Queens. And I'm sitting there, I get at the counter waiting for them to reheat my pizza. When two guys walk in, older guys, and one of them says to the other, Believe me, I think he's full of shit too, but he swore up and down that he 69'd her in Cunningham Park. Wow, I was like blown away. I grabbed my pizza and my Coke and I ran to Teddy Scharf's house. And I, Teddy opened the door and I said to him, I just learned something really big. Teddy goes, what? What did you learn? I paused a moment to give the, weight, the, the moment like the weight it deserved. And then I said, 69 is a verb. Teddy's eyes widened, you know, like, and he said, oh, crap. And I go, yeah, oh, crap. And we just sat there and, you know, it was stood there in his doorway and it was starting to get cold and, you know Teddy said to me oh my god you're shivering and uh, you know I thought he was going to invite me into his house but instead Teddy said to me well 
I still don't know what the hell 69 is about, but I'll tell you one thing. When 1969 rolls around, all hell's going to break loose. And that's the story. Mm. Oh, hey, Peter. Ow. Great. That was an amazing story, as always. I remember you did tell me that story once before on the Story Worthy podcast. You were amazing. Thank you, Peter, so much for that story. I really appreciate it. And really, again, you guys, check out Peter's book, hashtag me as well. It's really funny. Totally quality book. And look, we all got some time. Get yourself a new book and read it. Thanks, Peter. All right, you guys, we're going to wrap up this portion of the show, and then we'll begin Story Smash, the storytelling game show, and Blank Apache is going to kick us off. But right now, I want to give a big thank you to everybody who played. They didn't play. They told. Everybody who told a true story tonight, thank you so much, Samson McCormick. Everybody give a big round of applause for him, Samson McCormick, and Lisa Orkin. Lisa is always fabulous. And Ginny Sykes. Oh, Ginny, you're amazing. And uh, every time I see a skull, I'll think of you. <laughs> and of course, Peter Melman. Peter Melman. Woo, you're Peter. Peter's sticking around for Story Smash, as well as Lisa and Ginny are, go are both going to play the game. So you guys stick around for Story Smash. My name is Christine Blackburn. We'll see you next Sunday. Good night. I place my own bets and I make my own deals. So if you follow Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Oh,